Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of the Ride Along Radio Show here on the Morris Media Network. Uh, my name is George Holt. I've got 25 years in law enforcement, worked a variety of assignments and from SWAT to canine to detectives all the way up to supervisor. To my left is my co-host, Gil Contreras. Gil Contreras, happy to, uh, happy to be here. Former officer, um, uh, licensed investigator, uh, drug detection canine operator. My name's Kent. I'm a retired law enforcement as well in the L.A. County area. Um, been out for about 18 years now, and I'm retired, and I'm liking it. So now I get to say what I want to say. <laughs> which, is, which is the premise of the show. Essentially, uh, Ride Along Radio Show is developed and produced to provide a platform for the police and the community to interact on an honest level with no agendas, no political motivation. Because we're all off the job now, uh, we can lend our perspective and our credibility to a lot of social issues that are current, and we don't have to worry about uh, having to hear about it on Monday when we go back to the job. Right. So we have no agenda, uh, no department uh, talking points to, to speak on. We just want to address these topics and um, uh, address them in a forthright manner. Which, uh, And again, I've said this before, we were all pretty forthright when we were on the department. Uh, right. So, you know, now that we've been on leash, stand by, right, because uh, now, now we're able to talk about things in a public forum without violating any policies or being passed over pr promotion or right. anything and thing like I love that. about it the best is that you know we, we don't really worry about political correctness so I can say what I want to say and um. <laughs> exactly and and you know you'll find that between the three of us we're all across the board uh, politically um, like literally all across the spectrum <laughs> a real mixed bag here you are and uh, <laughs> and uh, and so you'll get some uh, some perspective on these issues that uh, you know a lot of people have expected this to be something where we were always going to be uh, touting the party line that uh, when something happened, we're always going to come down on the officer side or always come down against the citizen side. And if you've been watching us this month, uh, this is our fourth show. I think you'll see that that's, that's not always the case. We're just telling it like we see it. I mean, I think we were pretty, pretty openly critical of uh, some actions taken during the uh, Tamir Rice shooting on right. last week's episode. Right. And we're just, we're just here to tell it like it is. I mean, that's the basis of this is to put it out there. And uh, we encourage people to call in. The call-in number is 323-293-3375. You're already uh, watching us on morrismedialive.com. That's where you can catch us live every Thursday. Uh, if you have a question, you can submit it via Twitter at Ride Along Radio. You can even send us an email, ridealongradioshow at gmail.com. And you can hit us up on Instagram, Ride Along Radio Show. Um, so the first thing we like to do is we like to get into the, the news of the day. And Gil's going to take point on that today. Oh, okay. Um, well, you know, there's a lot in the news that uh, really has, you know, caught my attention. Um, you know, first of all, the uh, another police officer in New York City uh, was shot doing his job, you know, shot in the head by a career criminal with a gun. And, um, in New York? In New York City. I thought New York had gun control. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's like Chicago, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Wherever you have more gun control, you have more gun violence. And, and it isn't law-abiding citizens with guns. It's always criminals with criminals um, uh, shooting other criminals and innocent bystanders. So uh, that kind of caught my eye. Um, and, and you know, maybe in the future we'll do another show that kind of deals more in, in police officers killing the line of duty. Uh, but... Uh, but the the uh, the story that I had uh, for this segment is uh, there was a meeting that uh, Mayor Garcetti from Los Angeles held in the city of Inglewood a couple nights ago, and the purpose of the <laughs> the purpose of the meeting it was a community meeting to let the black community know oh hey we might get the Olympics here in Los Angeles uh, there might be some sports teams coming to Inglewood and you know the opportunities that that's going to provide to the quote black community close quote where the hell that is um, <laughs> all and, over yeah wherever that whatever street that is I don't know but um, and and instead of being able to give the community this information tell them about things that opportunities that are coming their way what happens black lives matter they show up, and what do they do? They start screaming and acting a foo, and uh, they shut down the meeting. They actually forced the mayor's. Uh, Where was the meeting? Was it, was it in Inglewood? It was in Inglewood. Yes. Okay. So these these uh, Black Lives Matters folks who are you know they're, they're quickly becoming you know a kind of a terrorist organization in my opinion, but. 
uh, so they shut down the meeting. They forced the, the, the mayor's uh, protection team to take him out of the meeting early. They tried to get him to his car. They, they were actually jumped. One woman actually jumped on the trunk of the of the vehicle and was jumping up. And it's just unbelievable. So I'm going to show a clip. And this a, it's a very short clip. It's just you know less than a minute long. No, this, but one, this one happened. This clip house, happened so. at Mayor Garcetti's house. They actually went to his house the next day. Hey, I voted for you. I voted for you. What are you and you're letting these people kill my people. What are you hiding from? Your officers are killing black people. Your officers are killing black people. And brown people. And poor white people. I voted for you. I want to take my vote back. I want my vote back. I want my vote back. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Hey, you You can't put hands on her. You're gonna fucking not Lord touch her. Cameras. You're gonna Lord sue like a motherfucker. Go in front of the camera. Stop hiding. Y'all got that on camera? You're on the Go wrong side of the camera. You're gonna get hurt. Y'all don't need to touch me though. Don't put your hands on her. Don't put your hands on her. So what's interesting to me, well, there's a couple of things, but first of all, what's interesting to me is that these Black Lives Matter activists believe that they can uh, interrupt a, a public meeting, they can block sidewalks, they can block you coming out of your house, getting into your car, and they believe they can do anything they want, stand anywhere they want, uh, interrupt anything they want. But they also falsely believe that no one can touch them. And if you watch the clip and, and listen to them, uh, one of the one of the protection detail, you know, he actually took a woman down at the back of the oh, excuse me at the back of the car. He actually took her down to the ground to get her to back off. These people won't back up. And I'm sure the 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 detail was told that uh, you know when we go when we when we get to my car, don't hurt anybody, right. don't touch anybody. Right, because the optics let's on just, that would be horrible. Let's just try to get me into the car, and I'll just wave and smile at them and hope you know we'll just ignore what they're saying. Um, but it really made it difficult for those guys to do their job, and it really made them look kind of uh, incompetent at trying to to move him to the car. Well, and that's one of the things I picked up on, just because executive protection is kind of my kind of my thing, just like it is for all all three. Of us, so I saw some some things there that they could have done differently. However, the main story here is that um, they have shown up and that they were being disruptive. And now I'm not going to go so far as to label them a terrorist organization because they haven't killed anybody. Yet. I said almost. You said okay, all right. I said so, almost. so you don't have to well, kill anybody to oh, be a terrorist. You, you have to use violence in order to sway a population per the legal definition of terrorism under the under well, but I, I think, I, I, I think the, but let, let me let me get on to my point and we'll get back to the nuances of the federal law regarding terrorism uh later maybe on a future show but let me say this about that about what they were doing unfortunately unfortunately i'm just saying because you know we're trying to i was going someplace with that okay go ahead all right uh, so drive uh, down the street go ahead unfortunately Unfortunately, we have a situation where uh, it's a it's a fractured, splintered movement that has no real organization. That's and the difference. No, 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 oh. no. Wait, we're okay. not done. No, no. Let, okay. I, mean, I told you to get back to that later. Right. Give me a finish. second. All right. Give me a second. <laughs> All right, intern Darren, get the taser ready. Yeah. Because, uh, okay. So, uh, so we have a situation where they have no organization, and it's kind of a grassroots movement without a formal structure or leadership in place. As a result. You have anybody can say that they're a Black Lives Matter activist, right? Because there's not like a national uh, organization that goes out and, and grants charters. And so listen to what I'm saying. Because if, they were, if there were, you would have people who were trained in civil disobedience, who would understand what the laws are and wouldn't do things like this that turn people's opinion against them. And so unfortunately, you have people representing that movement who are part of the movement. I'm not saying that they were strangers coming from Orange County to disguise themselves as, as Black Lives Matter activists. I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, as a result, things like this happen. It undermines the message. There's no um, organized talking points. And then you have people using profanity. You have people who are doing things that, look, that makes the whole thing look even worse on camera and kind of undermines any legitimacy that movement might have gained. Right. So I think that's unfortunate that they have decided to disrupt the community meeting for the. It was for the benefit of the community. That's right, as you that's pointed exactly out. Exactly right. It's talking about jobs, economic opportunities, and what's going to happen in the future. Positive thing. Correct. And they're there to disrupt that. Uh, had there been someone with some sense and some political savvy to give direction, they would have said, "We're not going to disrupt this. 
because then that's going to turn the community but, but against that's, us. But that's incorrect. They are part of a larger organization, and that is their game plan. It's just like the Wall Street group. You think it looks chaotic and there, there's no plan. There is a plan. They're part of a network of organizations. Well, it's a bad plan because... Uh, well, that is their plan. That's a bad it's, plan. It's called because anarchy. Well, but even the anarchists and even the black bloc and whatever tend to move with a little more social grace than that. So what I'm saying is... I don't know about that. Well, no, I no. What I, what I mean is they have, they have more targeting and more, they're more precise when they decide to make their moves. This was sloppy. This did nothing but make the movement look bad. They did this to Bernie Sanders when he was on the campaign trail. Right. And my whole point for bringing it up is that, and this is how it ties to the police officer getting killed in New York City. These, this group, this Black Lives Matter group, and politicians who support them and activists who support them are encouraging people now to act like this. And that's what's and making that's bad, police, right. police work more dangerous. And that's what's encouraging people to challenge, uh, challenge cops. Now, the guy in New York, he was a career criminal. You know, if, you know, we can talk about mass incarceration of the races or whatever and the, the drug war or whatever. The fact of the matter is that guy should have been in prison and should not even have been able to be on the street with his exactly. with his record and, and, and the kind of crimes he committed. And my understanding is there was actually a warrant out for his arrest because he was supposed to be in a diversion program that he didn't show up for. Right. He had yet another criminal case pending. So the NYPD went to go to the courtroom to wait him show up for that case. He failed to appear on that as well. And this is why he was out there free. Right. So, yeah, he should have been locked up. No doubt about that. So that's why I, I say that, you know, it, it's it's the, the, the whatever direction this group is trying to go, they're, tr they're trying to, and anarchy I think is a good word, uh, because what they want is, uh, uh, you know, what, what I heard the, after, the, after the shooting of the officer in New York and, and uh, some incident in Baltimore again, uh, is that they, really, they want fewer police. They have increasing crime. More, more uh, violent crime occurring in the community, but they want the police to pull out. There's even uh, somebody, uh, you know, suggesting to the L.A. Police Commission that LAPD be unarmed, for God's sakes. Are you I mean, kidding me? No, it's just it's gotten to the ridiculous point. OK, so and I'm, and I'm not disagreeing with anything you've said. Uh, what I'm saying is I think that that's a failure of leadership on whoever's in charge, because uh, there are some people, I think, is it Winston McKesson? Uh, he's an attorney. I'm sorry. There's a, there's, a, there's a couple of people who are on point for the Black Lives Matter movement nationally. They're the people who usually get interviewed on national media. They need to step in and, and try to bring a little more organization to this to stop that kind of thing from happening and get people on message and to give people the tools that they need. Because, you know, let's, let's face it, man, demonstration and protest are, are part of the, the DNA of this country. Right. Civil disobedience is part of the DNA of this country. But everybody who participated in that in the past, and this is why we've had the social progress that we've had in terms of the civil rights movement, et cetera, understood that when they went in, this was how, what we're going to do. This is how it's going to happen. This is how, you know, this is how you get some of the, the progress that we've made because it's been organized and it's been effective. This is not organized or effective, and it's not going to— uh, It is worldwide. What, it's part of a worldwide, worldwide organization— it is part of George Soros' open society. The Black it, Lives Matter movement? And Congress funds that. Yes, it is. And it is also uh, funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a, a neocon organization. All that money flows from governments. So where's the, money, where's the money going to, though? I mean, I'm not seeing... Where's the money going to? In all of the organizations. In so, all of the organizations. In George Soros' foundation has under it a, probably a 50 to 100 different supposedly nonprofit organizations for the purpose of, of upsetting uh, current governments worldwide and financial infrastructures worldwide. And Black and Lives he, Matter is one of those? At the very end, you know, uh, an umbrella group uh -huh. has organizations under it, and they then turn around and fund organizations. For instance, Human Rights Watch received $100 million from George Soros. Human Rights Watch then funds organizations under themselves like well, Black actually, Lives Matter. They actually funded one of the studies that we're going to be uh, referencing today. Human Rights Watch did. Well, and this is why um, we, we really need to get someone from that organization in here who can come in and, and have some knowledge of the organization. And not I just would somebody, love to have somebody. Not just somebody who wakes up and says, hey, uh, let's, let's, let's protest this. We're mad about it and, and moves forth under the hashtag of Black Lives Matter. But someone who's officially, if there's such a thing, affiliated with that organization on a national level or even a regional level who can come in and, 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 and we can talk. 
really openly and not not in a disrespectful way and not to challenge the very premise of it, but just to talk about and answer some questions that we may have. Like, I, I would love to have somebody to be able to present the other side of what you just said, because, um, you know, I'm sure they would like to refute that. Yeah. I'm sure they don't want the, the word out there or anybody saying that they're part of some worldwide conspiracy they're part to destabilize of governments internationally. 15 you know? pages of organizations that are tied into him. So, um, a, as a result, you have a situation where, uh, well, the, you know what, then he needs to spend a little bit more money and get them uh, get them back on track. Cause he's obviously, trying. He's 80 years old, and he's going to die soon, and he's giving away just about all of his money that he can before he goes. All right. Well, um, uh, they remind me of the Occupy movement. You know, and they they were just disorganized. Right. You know, uh, that was people, even that was people, even better. People just decided you recognize it because they're one and the same. Well, that that was even done better, uh, and, and with a little I don't know how much impact they had, but it was it was done better. Uh, we need to take a break, but if you care to comment on this topic or any other uh, police slash community related topic, but preferably this one, you can call in three two three two nine three 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 seven five. You can tweet your questions to uh, at Ride Along Radio, or you can send us an email to Ride Along Radio Show at gmail.com. We've got to go to a break. We'll be right back. That was my news of the day, by the way. All right, so welcome back to the Ride Along Radio Show. Uh, I'm George Holt. I'm Kent. Gil Contreras. And uh, we've got a guest today. Uh, we have an in-studio guest, uh, Charles Gaither, uh, J.D., uh, who Charles actually was a, an LAPD officer for a number of years and uh, left, went, uh, left and went to another law enforcement agency uh, on the federal level and uh, went, to, went to law school and, and got himself all learned up. Yeah. And uh, then he uh, came back to work a, in the Civilian Oversight Department at the Los Angeles Police Department, the officer of the Inspector General. So, Charles, you can talk about your background a lot more than I could. Uh, yeah, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. I worked for LAPD for uh, about four years, and I had aspirations on uh, working on the federal side. So I went and joined the Postal Inspection Service and dealt with uh, mail bombs and identity theft and things of that sort. And uh, then after that, I uh, went to law school and uh, worked for the city attorney in Seattle for a little while. And uh, then I uh, joined the uh, inspector general's office for LAPD. Now, can you explain what that what that is exactly? Because a lot of people may not be clear on what the inspector general's office does. Okay, the inspector general's office is charged with providing uh, oversight of the police department. Uh, they're basically the eyes and ears of the police commission. All right, so they're like the administrative and investigative arm of the police commission. And so... Uh, their power pretty much came about after the consent decree was enacted. You know, I'm sure we all recall the consent decree back in the uh, 90s and the early part of 2000 when they brought right. Chief Braden over uh, to uh, administer or to bring about the changes that uh, uh, were contemplated by the federal uh, uh, the by Department the Warren Commission. Yeah, the Warren Commission and the DOJ. Uh, the, settled, the, Chris, the Christopher Commission. The Christopher Commission. Oh, that's right. Christopher yeah, Commission. I'm sorry. Yeah, Christopher. I'm sorry. But it was really set to kind of uh, ensure or, or that the LAPD was properly aligned with best practices in law enforcement. And so uh, the Inspector General's Office played a key role in uh, making sure that happened. So they looked at, they conducted performance audits to ensure that the uh, police department operated efficiently and uh, with respect to the laws and, 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 and other governing um, policies. Uh, they looked at uh, officer-involved shootings or use of force issues. Now, this was this is civilian oversight. Though? This is civilian oversight. I would say that it's most it's the the most effective form uh, of civilian oversight in the country uh, because it's uh, like I said, they're the eyes and ears of the police commission. Uh, they've been vetted uh, by the police commission. A lot of the uh, investigators who work uh, for the IG's office have prior law enforcement experience or their background is in auditing, so they know what they're doing. Uh, in the beginning, it was, was pretty tough because they questioned the expertise. You know, a lot of officers are reluctant to have anyone look over their shoulders. The question is going to be, well, who are you to look over my shoulder? You don't know right. anything about law enforcement. But I would argue that the IG's office is by far the best in the, in the business because a lot of the uh, investigators have law enforcement expertise. Um, they all, um, a great many have uh, law degrees or their CPAs. I mean, they know how to look for. How to audit things. How to audit exam. things. And so they're very good at it. And so I. Um, well, now, let, let me, let's clarify the role of the police commission, because people think about police commission and they think about the police commissioner and they think about a guy in a uniform someplace. But in Los Angeles, our police commission is entirely uh, civilian. Right. right. They're, they're civilian and they are appointed to, uh, I believe it's four or five year terms. By the mayor? By the mayor. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, I think they, you know, and so. They've been around for many, many years. It's not like they just started. They've been around right. for 
I mean, I, you know, well over 60, 70 years. I mean, they, to kind of give you an idea of how it works, uh, I guess it's best to describe like a corporation, right? You have a corporation, you have a, a board of directors, and you can argue right. that that's like kind of analogous to uh, the police commission. And then you have the president who has the, of the corporation, who has administrative control of the company, the direction of the company, and all of that. That would be analogous to the chief of police, right? So okay. the president answers to the board just as the police chief answers to the, the police commission. The police commission. So, so those are all. So, so there's been a form of civilian oversight for many years. For many years, for but many years. this is another. This moving to the next level. I would. I would assume. Right? Yes. 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 I think it's. They're very effective. Very good at what they do. Well, uh, so now it should be obvious to everyone when we brought Charles in to discuss today's topic, which is examining the police code of silence, because one of the things you guys had to do was you would review internal affairs investigations. Uh, Correct. Right. Yes. Yes, we'd review them for quality and make sure that every question was answered. I think a lot of the, the problem that we found the most was that they never really asked the appropriate follow-up question, right? What I mean by that is, you know, let's say you have a, a situation where there's an officer involved shooting. An officer would draw his weapon and fire, and say during the questioning, uh, the uh, I.O. or the investigating officer would say, well, why did you shoot? Uh, why did you draw your weapon? You know, and the officer would say, well, I feared for my safety. And they would move on to the next question. See, the, the appropriate follow-up question would be, well, what did the suspect do that caused you to fear? You know, that way we right. can evaluate whether it's, it was reasonable or not. Sure. Right? Just to say that I feared for my safety is not enough. We need to know what the suspect did that caused you to fear so that we can say, well, what you did next was reasonable under a Graham v. Connor kind of a standard. Graham v. Connor is the bright line rule that governs use of force uh, uh, incidents throughout the country. You know, it acts... What would a reasonable officer do if he was confronted with a similar situation? Right. right? So that's kind of what we would do in terms of auditing these reports or reviewing the investigation that was done by FID or Force Investigations Division, LAPD's uh, at, at investigative arm with respect to uh, uses of force or what we call categorical uses of force where there's, um, let's say, a law enforcement related injury or an in-custody death or an officer-involved shooting. FID is charged with investigating that shooting or that incident, the OIG would then review the investigation, point out deficiencies, and then give the LAPD an opportunity to respond to, you know, maybe, you know, so that way we can make sure that the investigation is quality and that there's no... So it's quality control, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. we referred to the, com the Christopher Commission earlier, and I'm going to read you a quote um, from a, uh, a report that we're referencing today that was actually funded by Human Rights Watch. Uh, regarding the uh, police code of silence. Now, this is specifically uh, about the LAPD, but I think that it would apply to a lot of agencies. And if you believe some of the things that we found in another uh, report, uh, all agencies, it says the, uh, the Christopher Commission, writing on the LAPD, found that, and this is in direct quotes, perhaps the greatest single barrier to the effective investigation and adjudication of complaints is the officer's unwritten code of silence, the principle that an officer does not provide adverse information against a fellow officer. And so there was a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of conclusions reached by the Christopher Commission, but one of them was uh, police officers are given special powers unique in our society to use force, even deadly force, in the furtherance of their duties. Along with that power, however, must come the responsibility of loyalty first to the public the officers serve. That requires that the code of silence not be used as a shield to hide misconduct. I, I don't think, you know, and there's, certain, uh, uh, there's an article in Police Chief Magazine that starts off, code of silence, fact or fiction. And uh, honestly, I, I don't know why anybody felt the need to title that that way. It's an excellent article, but I, I, don't, well, I don't think the, it was a question. The, the reason... <laughs> you they, know? have to read the article. <laughs> the, the, reason, the reason it was titled like that is because, you know, we're all cops, right? So I remember when I swore in uh, to, uh, to uh, abide by the code of silence, Right, and then we signed, of, yeah, <laughs> and then we signed a document, right? So you yeah, oh yeah, there's a code of silence that comes with this badge, and so that please was the sign code of ethics. Please sign here, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, 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 there's 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 truth to what you said, even there's, though that's I, back I, east. You know, and, not and, out and, west, right? Right. Well, right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're joking, but I, I recall when I joined the police department, you know, that I was in the gym with all my my fellow classmates, and there was a black line in the gym. And we all cross that line, right? And once we cross it, we were told you will always be LEPD. That there's no going back, right? And so what we did was join a family, right? Which is no different from any other family. And you know, sometimes with respect to family secrets, you don't want to 
talk about those things. You want to handle those things inside. And so it might not be as clear cut as signing your name on a dotted line that says, I'm not going to reveal these secrets or I'm not going to rat out another police officer. But in order to do that job, you have to have the respect and the uh, of the other officers. You have to have their support um, because you're not talking about just going to the market. You know, you're talking about real life issues. Life you, and death. Life and death. Seriously, life and death issues where you need their support. Where if you get a 211 call. Which suspect, is a robbery. Yeah, suspect there now, shots fired. You're expecting everybody to roll in your direction to provide that support. But I recall a time when I had a case like that. Uh, you know, I want to give you some context. You know, there was a police officer who uh, called a black man uh, a nigger, okay? And I did not appreciate that. And so I was a P3 uh, supervisor, uh, not P, well, I was a senior officer. Right. You know, and I pulled the officer aside and says, don't say that around me. Okay, don't, don't, don't do that around me. And what you might do at home is one thing, but when you're in the field with me, don't use that language and don't refer to these people that way. Was he black or white? He was white. Okay. That shouldn't okay. make a difference. It doesn't though. make a difference. What I had a conversation with a black officer. It doesn't make a difference. It, 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 is, it was not right. But this was a senior officer, a very well-respected officer, out of Southeast Division. And uh, so, you know, I was a newly created P3. And so there was a 211 call. There was a suspect there now, situation with shots fired. And I expected... All the units from my roll call to roll to my location to help me. But that didn't happen. I had mid-PM units and people from crash who, I, when I were crashed, they supported me. But nobody from my, from my roll and call. And do you think that was a result of that conversation? Well, it, well, well at, at first, I thought, well, no, maybe they were busy because it's a busy division. Right. You know? And so I'm thinking, okay. but when For it's, those, those who don't know, uh, LAPD Southeast Division covers the... The section known nationwide as Watts. That's the city. That's the section of the city. Right. The Southeast Division. You had a partner that day. I had a partner that day. He was a he was a what we call a boot or a newly created New officer. police officer. And so you know, I would I, again. I didn't want to say, oh well, this is racism or this is whatever. I just thought, okay, perhaps they were busy. Maybe there was a, there were a lot of calls. They were uh, you know unable to respond. But when it happened the second and the third time, that when you know that's when it started to make me think like, what is this really about? You know, and that happened more and more. And so the, the frequency of it caused me to say, well, geez, what's really happening here? So yeah. are you saying that officers from your own division, from your own watch, that were working the same shift as you, that when you had problems out in the field or you got a hot call on the field, are you saying they didn't respond? And just, I, and just one comment. And, and, and that's it, right? There was just one comment made, and that's all you're bring, it's well, what you're bringing to the table right now. Right. right. Yeah, there, were, there, were, there was just that one comment that I addressed with the very senior officer for that watch, you know, the guys that sit in the back of the roll call room, guys that are— Say so you addressed it with the person who made the comment. Right. And I you, said— You didn't yeah. go to the supervisor or anything like that. You didn't want directly to the officer. Well, again, there's an etiquette. We were talking about a code of silence, right? We're talking about how things are done in the field, and sometimes the, the first step or the expectation is that you address these sort of things with the officer. Exactly. Right. And then if you don't get the result that you want, then you go up the chain to your sergeant. If not, then you keep on going up the chain because I firmly believe in the chain of command. How high up the chain did you go? After that, I, I you know, I went to my sergeant, and I, you know, but after, you know, but nothing really came of it. That's pretty well, bad, too. If you had a partner, you're, the partner's being um, hung out the dry, too. Correct? Right. Right. Well, right. you know, the thing is this. And we've always said that your peers are your first level of supervision. And that's in any job, but especially in, in law enforcement. So the fact that you went to that officer and said something directly to that officer, I mean, to me, that officer, if the officer had any sort of character, would have respected the fact that you came to them because a lot of other people would have gone right to the supervisor with that. And right. that would have been a whole other bag of worms for them to worry about. But what I, walked, worms. what I walked away with was they realized that I was different, that I wasn't going to play ball and allow, you know, that I'm not going to kind of turn my eye away from those but I can't, I can't, I can't believe that you'd be the first black officer in Southeast Division to tell somebody not to drop the n bomb on somebody. You know I, what I mean, that's amazing to me. And and I, I mean, I know a lot of guys that work Southeast, a lot of black guys that work Southeast Division, and I just don't see some of them letting that slide. How many other black officers were on your shift, by the way? Uh, this was back in ninety six, ninety seven, uh, ninety eight, around that time. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm trying to remember. It's hard to say because it was so long ago. Uh, but I was the only uh, P3, uh, black P3 on that watch. Black P3 or black officer on the shift? Black P3 on that watch. And I think we may have had maybe two other blacks in the field at the time. Did you talk to them about it? No. I, I spoke with the guy responsible. 
And, uh, but later, when you went up the chain, it must have filtered out everywhere. Did you ever speak to them about it? No, I didn't. No, no. Well, you know, and, and one of the things that, so I think uh, all the all the studies that, that I reference and that I think we looked over kind of concludes that a code of silence certainly exists, and that's why I was chuckling at the title of uh, fact or fiction. However, the question then, because let's let's be honest, every career, every job where people are together, whether it's even life or life or death or not. You still have a, uh, you still have social pressure, whether you're talking about a group of teachers, a group of nurses, uh, a group of bus drivers. When people feel like, uh, people want to belong. Okay, people want to be part of cliques at work, or they want to feel comfortable at work because they spend so much time there. Right. And so there is a social pressure that uh, that's applied in every career I've ever heard of, any serious career where people have to work together. So. That exists everywhere. However, one of the one of the conclusions that was uh, met or, or that was reached at the uh, annual conference of the uh, International Association Association of Chiefs of Police, um, and this article was written by uh, Neil Trotman, who's the director of the National Institute of Ethics, was that the code of silence exists, the police code of silence exists, and he led with that. That was the number one conclusion. And um, you know, the question is how how deep does it go? Because again, I would say that every job, there's, I don't care what job you had, everybody knows that there's coworkers doing things they're not supposed to do. Mm. And it's frowned upon for you to immediately go and run and go tell the supervisor that this person is doing something they're not supposed to do. The difference is because our, of our profession, because it's life or death, because the, the authority that we have is so far beyond most other professions mm. that that can sometimes lead to abuse of power. And then the question is, then do you speak on it? But well, I, I think that the, the number of a, quote, abuse of power, close quote, attributed to a, quote, code of silence, close quote, is small. You know, police work is, is messy. It, you have to respond to it as it unfolds in front of you. And, and police work is not for sensitive people. You know, as a Latino officer, you know, <laughs> if somebody called me, I can't tell you the number of times I've been called a coconut. Uh, you know, if words offend you like that, then maybe police work's not the place. Well, that's, it's, that's it's directed wait, toward but, you. But wait yeah. a second. Because it's not a place for, for sensitive people, especially when you're patrolling or, or working a high crime urban area. And if a bad word slips out or some slur slips out, you should hear the way people talk to the police. Oh, right, but that's and, different, though, Gil, no, that, because that's, that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's, all he's I'm, not saying all that he I'm, got called that. He's saying all, a citizen got called that. All I'm saying is that if you're that sensitive, if your ears are that sensitive, then maybe that's not the... the well, the, the, no, the, but you, the, you can't stand by and let citizens get abused like that. I mean, that's still calling verbal somebody, abuse. If you're calling that's, somebody, is that who's, not verbal abuse? somebody who's resisting or somebody you're arresting and you get into so it... So you and, drop that word and, on them and it's okay? And, and if, no. they, if the word slips out, it slips out. That's, no, 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 that's, no, that's not that's, okay, That's man. not what it's that's about. Because okay. I think we, we, we all know about internal affairs. We also know that it uh, is uh, a violation of our policies to regard a citizen that way. Right? Can you be? Well, are we talking about citizens or criminals? Who are we talking well, about? Well, it doesn't right? matter. They're yeah, all protected. Matter. No, 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 it doesn't it matter, sure man. Does matter. There's not matter. one policy that says you I, treat criminals this way and citizens the other look, way. Look, the you, manual if, does if not you say. Spend, if you spend one day out in the field, you know yourself from personal experience that you treat criminals a hundred percent different yeah. than you treat. But the policy doesn't the, allow the, for community. that. Charles. The policy doesn't allow for that. No. You were you were bringing up an incident that happened internally inside the department, mm -hmm. as as a uh, code of silence. No, no, no. Sample. No, example. No, no, no. I was talking about, you know, again, when we crossed this line, the, the question was, you know, we were talking about, you know, you had made the joke about, well, you know, there's this contract that right. we sign and there's this and that. All I was saying is that, you know, when I joined the department, I crossed that line and I was told that we're always going to be family here, that you're LAPD. And I, and I also talked about how within families, there is this position where we don't share our secrets or we don't talk about our family things publicly. And I gave an example of how there was a situation that I tried to address mm -hmm. as a member of the family mm -hmm. by saying, hey, look, you know, I, that's not an appropriate, that's an inappropriate comment that, that does, that's, you know, and it wasn't a situation where the guy was aggressive or combative. This wasn't an arrest situation. This was a guy who had every right to be where he was and he was he wasn't, you know, he wasn't charged with any crime. This was. Well, a, why were you guys contacting him then? There was a situation that we could. We're, there was a situation in the field, and so he was there. And so this officer was trying to force his way uh, to kind of reconcile the situation. And so he thought that the best way to kind of show control would be to say, "Hey, nigga, get out the street," because people weren't moving fast enough. 
And so that's the context. It wasn't like this guy was a criminal or anything like that. And how, how did the, quote, citizen, close quote, how did he respond to that? Uh, how do you, yeah, he was very upset about okay. it, and so I. So, it, so now he starts inching, inching towards 148. No, no, no. I just are, are you kidding now, me? How are you going to inch toward 148 if someone disrespects you, calls you nigger, and you say, "Why are you going to call me that? Is That's that not is that is, is that 148? You have a right no, to speak this on is a that. situation where a guy you was disrespected a, by a police officer. If you have an investigation officer, that you're conducting, and everybody That's starts not obstruction. Negative. That's you're not still, obstruction. That's not obstruction. I, you know what? I've That's, been to a, I've been to uh, a lot of police training in my 25 years, and I never have ever been told that it's okay to say that to gain control of a situation. And in fact, if you understand the community, you know that's the last thing you're going to say if you're trying to gain control of it. Right. That's going to set things off more than anything else. Yeah, Everything I, could be perfectly fine. And I totally to understand that the use up. of tactical language when you have a situation sure. where you're trying to control a situation. I totally get that, but this is not what that was. All right, and I also know that even, a policy even doesn't... if that's still, you can call a guy an Adam Henry or drop an MF on him before you call him that, right? Because that's going to make the situation it, go way right. to the yeah. left, and you got no defense on that when you get called in front of the man for it, right? The thing that you don't get uh, is that I was there, Gil, right, and I, I know the context in which this thing was, and so maybe I'm not doing it, a, uh, you know, uh, doing it right in terms of defining and explaining it to you, but it was inappropriate. It wasn't necessary. I can't okay. think of a situation where there, it would be appropriate, you know, it, it was not. And so what I said was, especially in front of my boot or my, you know, training. You know the training, my trainee, that this is not the standard that I want to set for him. This is not how we do business. And this is inappropriate. And so I chose to speak with the officer instead of filing a, a complaint or doing Which anything Which I would have thought would have been respected and by that's that officer. Ex that's exactly what should have happened. Exactly. As with 99% of the things that happen, I can bet you one thing for sure, and I'm just going to say this and you can debate me on it, but being a white boy in a totally Hispanic, predominantly black department and totally Hispanic and uh, black projects that we worked in, I'll bet you that I was a recipient of more racist language. Oh, I'm sure you were. Than you could even imagine. Not, sure only, not only on the street, from day one, on sure. probation, but inside the department as well. Right. And you know what? Um, it was it was a shock to me, but I got to learn to live with it, just as they learned to live with what I had to say about them when it came time. We shared epithets, we we were on each other's butts, we made fun of each other's heritage, ethnicity, and race, and we got to, we got over it, and it became a joke, and it was very funny. Okay, we we dealt with it. That's right, so, but that's not what this was, though. It it wasn't. This was somebody abusing a citizen, and he went to talk to that person about that. Okay, let me get it for instance. I don't want to go too far down this road on this particular incident because we have a lot of ground to cover, and we don't have a, a whole lot of time. Right. But um, so some of the conclusions that were, and, and this touches on this stuff too, was that the police, the police code of silence exists. I think the only question is to what extent does it exist. Um, another uh, conclusion was some, for, some form of a code of silence will develop among officers in virtually any agency. And I think that's because it'll develop in any profession, too. Any place where people work together. I don't care if you work at Pet Boys. Well, the, there's there's going to be somebody. You're going to cover for each other, not necessarily in matters of criminality, but just in matters of, of maybe guys out of policy or something. Because what he did, he didn't break the law when he called the man that. No. But it was certainly outside the scope of what he was supposed to be doing. No, but, like, again, if you have a brother or someone that you respect and love, you're going to say to that guy, hey, look, man, there's a better way to do that. Yeah, that's what you do as a family member, right? So we're talking, when you're talking about the code of silence or... You know, I'm talking about those issues, those things that relate with the police family, right? Whether those things involve misconduct or a better way of doing things. I'm going to pull you aside because I want you to be safe. I want you to make it home. I want you to promote. I don't want you to have a, a jacket where people look at you and say, that guy's trouble. And right? that's the best thing. For, I, I don't know how you could have handled it any better. I think it would have been wrong for you not to address it at all. Right. And I wouldn't have, myself, I wouldn't have gone to supervision on it. I just would have done what you did, which is approach the officer about it. Right. But the thing, touching on your point, though, you know, you know, you're talking about how this might happen at Pep Boys or this might happen in regular industry. I think what people fail to realize is that police, police officers are drawn from the general community. Right. There are people like anybody else with biases who used to work at who, Pep Boys who might have worked at Pep school Boys and whatever or, else. You yeah. know, we're not pulling police officers from a magical pool of the society. All right. These are regular people who we vet as best we can by background checks or 
you know, uh, polygraph examinations, and and some and some bad apples make it through despite our best efforts, right? Or maybe and they're they, not bad apples at first. Not bad that, apples. That's at been first. my theory on most misconduct. Is no. this person started off? They as made a it good through the person. gate, and then you threw them into the pool. Right. And then that's where it starts. Right. It starts then, in the academy, and it starts at the at the department. And, right. And, 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 and then you the see what it's, level, then you see what it's like to deal with a criminal day in and day out, and you see. The, I'm ghetto raised. The did, you, did, you, did you know that? As an adult, I've been raised in the ghetto. Hmm. I've taken on certain aspects of that community. So does our department in the way we interact. Well, with each and other. that's that's the thing that in any corporate culture, whether it, whether it's a, a, a private corporation or whatever, you're going to develop a culture there. Now, I mean, when you talk about police code of silence, I, I thought you were talking about like Rampart. You know where cops well, we're were getting there. Cops were committing crimes and we're then lying there. about that's that's, that's why I didn't want to that's why I didn't want to get too exactly bogged down in this one incident because that's, that's where this, we're going. This is police work for God's sake. Uh, ah, but that's uh, <laughs> but here's the thing though. Yes and no. <laughs> yeah, because here's the thing. One of the things that people were here we go is that one of the one of the issues that officers uh, were afraid of and that helped enforce the code of silence was the fear of ostracism. The fear of not getting backup when you wanted backup, and that actually was uh, uncovered in one of a, uh, and actually right here, repercussions for breaking the code of silence include ostracism, threats, and the fear that officers will not back up or protect an officer who breaks the code. Well, you that's, know? that's the, and again, that goes back to the 211 call that I they, they, right they exactly. That, that's why I thought it was uh, interesting that you brought that up because that was one of the things in in this report here that talks about that that people are concerned about ostracism. And, because here's the thing, you're never well. I shouldn't say never. Typically, you will not be terminated from your job because you reported another officer. Sometimes it depends on who that officer was, okay, or officer is, and who you are within the department. Because actually one of the, the number nine conclusions that, that they reached with the uh, International Association of Chiefs of Police was that whistleblowers are generally not supported by the administration of law enforcement agencies. Right. I know a person right now is fighting to get his job back because he blew the whistle on someone of a higher rank. And, uh, and now that man is sitting at home terminated for something that he shouldn't have been terminated for, that he wouldn't have been terminated for had he not been a whistleblower. Right. So so that's certainly the case. But here's the most important thing, because even something like that where there's not criminal activity, that like again, that, that man dropping the end bomb on that uh, on that uh, citizen or criminal, whatever you want to call him, is not a violation of law. But the code of silence, and this is conclusion number four, breeds, supports, and nourishes other forms of unethical actions. Because how far do we go with that? Or where does it start? I, I mean, if you recognize, okay, this is going to end badly, right? Because the one thing I recall when I graduated from the academy was, hey, forget everything that you learned in the academy. This is how it's done in the street, right? And right, so and I, I think everybody got that speech when they, when they came out. Exactly. So we're going to take a quick break, and then uh, we're going to roll back around. But, hey, feel free to call in, 323-293-3375. Uh, or you can uh, tweet us at Ride Along Radio or send us an email, ridealongradioshow at gmail.com. We'll be right back. I would love to give you... Not healthy. All, my All right, so we're back here at the Ride Along Radio Show. Again, feel free to call in, 323-293-3375. You can tweet your questions at Ride Along Radio. Uh, and, and if you've been listening to the show, this really is like being in a damn police car. It <laughs> really is. <laughs> the discussion that's going really on here. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's funny. Not, and it better not leave the car. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Because of the code of silence that right. I signed. That's right. <laughs> code of silence, never heard of it. Anyway, so uh, how about testa lying? Yeah, that, that's another that's Hello. another phrase that actually Hello. got mentioned in one of these uh, reports here. That was on the code of silence uh, contract, though. Oh, oh the yeah, testa lying. Yeah, so you're covered. Oh, yeah. That's, that's all Article Six. Of the that's contract. a whole different thing. Yeah. So, so you know, we talked about this. Uh, you touched on it briefly about the abuses of power and uh, use of force. One of the conclusions they reached was that the code of silence is prompted by excessive use of force incidents more than for any other specific circumstance. And so, I don't think that the point they made is that. The code of silence caused abuses of power. Right. I think that after uh, something that looks like an abuse of power is when the code of silence typically kicks in or when it's prompted uh, to kick but in. I, I think just very quickly, and I want to get to Kent, but I, I just think that you know what we're talking about here is really just police work. And, and sometimes when people resist or whatever, they get hurt. And, uh, you know, and, and it doesn't look pretty. Well, yeah, if, but if you're watching, you should the, be able to tell the story the way but, it happened, though. But but if if you if you went a little too hard, if you did, but you were fighting, okay, you know, you 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 resisted and you got hurt, okay, right? But that's different than 
people but, saying and, that and, that didn't and, happen but, at all. But you're saying if the if the partner doesn't then dime off his partner because oh he used excessive force over there and you know I didn't think that we needed to go all that. I mean, uh, unless it, it's criminal for God's sake. Well, that's the thing. It's just police. That's work. the only time I think anybody even cares. Really, is when we cover up criminal uh, misconduct or misconduct that rises to the level of being criminal because. Other than that, it's all internal. Police you know? work is messy, and you have to respond. Sure, and I say that unfolds. all the time. I should get a T-shirt that says "Police work isn't pretty" because I say that all the time. But uh, but if something happens and you can't really talk about exactly what happened or why it happened, then you got a problem there. You yeah. know, and, and and the code of silence is one of the things that sometimes emboldens bad officers to continue to be bad officers because they know that they'll be protected by their family. And I can think of a couple of guys that we know that would maybe still have careers, they'd probably be retired by now, but they'd be pensioned off right. as opposed to being convicted felons had someone said something to them earlier in their careers. And I feel bad when I think about that, the fact that I was one of the people who didn't say something, and maybe I should have said something. I mean, I would have faced ostracism like Charles did, but maybe I should have said something to, to those two officers I can think of in particular. Hmm. So? You waiting for yes. me? Yes. So I'm going to give a story here about um, uh, the code of silence is, that's probably applicable. So back in the 90s, I'm working uh, working in a particular neighborhood, very, very closely uh, working, building relationships, community-based policing. Um, a family gives me a jacket at Christmas time um, as a show of appreciation for a lot of the things that I helped uh, do with the family, like giving them uh, my car that had 300,000 miles on it for free because the family in the community family. you were working. Correct. Okay. So I get the jacket, I put it in the trunk. I got a partner, the guy. So this is me talking about him, my opinion. Uh, kind of a, I think he's a bad apple. He came from another department uh, and on bad circumstances, left and went back as well. Uh, he decides to uh, report me to the supervisor for receiving a present, which was against our policy. A gratuity. A gratuity. So I was asked about it, and I said yes, I did, and I explained why. And uh, the supervisor, who was real debatable whether he liked me or not, didn't take any action on it. And he was really agitated about the fact that this officer had brought this to his attention. Fast forward, we're in, a, in, a, in another housing project that's at night. This officer and his partner go code six on a Same call. officer. Same officer, and uh, they have three, or, uh, two or three guys on their knees with their hands behind their their head, and they had a you know and it was a kneeling prone, and he was talking to him up deliberately in his face, and um, the next thing you know, uh, we pull up, I get out, I'm watching this, and my partner, he reaches up with the flashlight and bangs the guy right over the forehead with his flashlight. Did you not hear what I told you? And that guy jumped off the ground. The, the suspect, so so-called suspect, jumps up off the ground and says, "Why did you hit me?" The next thing you know, there's a, a quick melee, a wrestling match to the ground, and the, the partner's also forced to wrestle his guy to the ground. They're handcuffed, taken to jail. He turns around and he sees me and he says, "Oh no!" Right. Hmm. Exactly. That was interesting. All I said, and I got in the car. Let's go. My partner and I got in the car and we drove off. The next day, I went in to read the report. And the report didn't say exactly what happened. It said something else, according to what I saw. So I walked into the briefing room, and that officer just happened to get there a little early. And I had the report in my hand, and it was just he and I in that room. There was an adjoining supervisor's room. There was one supervisor in there on duty. And I started reading the report out loud to him. Hmm. And I said, mm 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 <laughs> Do you find anything wrong with this report? And, and your partner signed it too. And he became very visibly upset. Sure. Anxiety ridden, agitated, becoming loud, paced back and forth, and becoming, you know, puffing out his chest and starts yelling at me, saying, Is there something that you want to report to the supervisor? Is there something you want to say? And I said, I think I said it. It's in the report. He ran into the supervisor's room and said, Kent has something that he wants to say to you. Wow wants to put me on the spot am i going to tell the supervisor what it is that happened and the supervisor came out and said what's the matter and i said i don't know i think that the guy's mentally unbalanced that's what i think take a look at him listen to what he's saying and i said here's your report and i just dropped it on the table and i walked out wow okay i walked wow. outside and i saw his partner loading up his vehicle and I and and is you know the the that person the officer in question had already walked out and talked to his partner and I walked outside, and I looked at him and I said you don't need to worry, 
I'm not going to say anything. I said, but that's your problem. If this goes down, and I'm just making you aware of this, if this goes down and this guy files a complaint and there's an investigation, we were code six there, I'm going to say what happened. Sure. So I decided what the dividing line was right there internally for my, you know, my own survival rate. Right. And the fireworks at the department and all the uh, vested interests in the, the parties that would be involved and what they were going to do and to whom and for what reason. Okay. And I, and I, and I walked. I let it go. Well, you know, and that's, now, is, that's, is, that, is that code of silence? I well, say, I think it I is. Say, yeah. I think that it is. I, I think it's it's quite clearly uh, code of silence because you witnessed what was what was an abuse. But he now might, let's talk he, about he, why he, that he was. Might have, he might have a reason for what he did, but he would have to totally justify that. Right, I and mean, you saw the interaction, and you didn't. Okay, so and sometimes that's true, right. and sometimes it is. Sometimes that's it, true. It depends on what angle you're looking at that's it from. Right. I understand that. I could clock somebody who's standing there but, looking at me, and somebody doesn't know what's happening. I know he's getting ready side, to make sure. a move on me, and I don't need somebody standing over my shoulder to tell me what I just saw. And sure. I may drop the dude, but it's not going to look pretty, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's, they're going to that's accuse exactly me. my point. Understood. That's exactly my point. Understood. But when somebody is lying, when somebody is, is, is committing an abuse of power, then they write about it differently in the report. It says to me that you don't feel comfortable with what you did, so now you're going to change it up. But the flip side of it is, in this situation, did you want to face ostracism working out there? In the, in, the, in the environment we worked in, did you want to risk not having backup? I was not afraid of ostracism, but I wanted to pick my own battle in terms of when I wanted to do that. And, and you all that know me know that I wasn't um, shy about fighting the department about right and wrong. So no, no, I, I, don't, you're not, I don't believe that you, 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 you hold back at all. But again, you know, in terms of defining what the code of silence is, you know, again, it, it, we could argue that it's just an unwritten rule. Uh, that exists amongst police officers that says, well, with respect to errors that you might make or decisions that might be inconsistent with our policies or even misconduct or crimes, that I'm not going to talk about that or I'm going to choose another way to address it. You know, that in a way that, it, for me, that's what the code of silence is. It's, it's the discretionary right. aspect of a police officer's job where he says, you know what, I'm going to talk about this or I'm not going but to that, talk about But it. that's a wide area, the discretionary. That's what, what I'm saying. That's the, and the code of silence is a wide area because we've seen cases like Serpico in New York. Where right. Frank uh, the, Serpico the, the, the came out to, to yep. speak out, that's where the NAP Commission came in to speak out about corruption within the police department, and they tried to kill Frank from Serpico. From top to bottom. Right, from top to bottom, exactly, and they tried to kill that man. So bad that so he's now living a, in Switzerland. But that's a different, <laughs> see, but that's a different thing than a one on one situation where it's not a systemic problem of, of widespread corruption. It's a one on one thing where you're, you said something, you said something. And then we start to see the ramifications of that. Right. I think what we're, I guess what we're talking about, getting to Gil's point, again, talking about, well, this is police work. This is police work. Because, you know, being in a car with, with your partner, you're, gonna, you're in the car for eight hours or so. Sometimes 12. Sometimes 12, sometimes longer if there's a UO or an unusual occurrence. And so you get to know your partner and you get to know what they really think. And, you know, and, and some things you might agree with, some things you might not agree with. But at the end of the day, it's about making sure that he makes it home. And then I make it home safely, right? And so you might get along with a guy who's a bona fide racist, but within that car, you guys are buddies. And you're going to be buddies sure. for the next 12 hours. Sure, seen it happen before. And, 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 and that's before. just what it is. But it's not something that you go back and say to your sergeant, uh, well, he's a racist, I'm not going to work with. And you deal with it, that's part of the job. Mm-hmm. What I'm talking about is are those things where it diminishes the, uh, the, the, the perception of the police department. Like I recall a time when I was wor- walking a foot beat in Nickerson Gardens, and I waved at a kid. And the kid was walking with his mom, and, the, and, and he waved back at me. And the mother slapped the kid's hand for having waved at me right. because of the perception of the police. And so when you have an officer that goes out there and re- drops the N-word or is just so disrespectful, it just aids this perception of the police as being a negative entity, that they're invaders and whatnot. Now, we have to understand that we work with these people, and if we're going to resolve these crimes and whatnot, we have to work and bring them in the fold so that we can solve crimes. You can't do it by ourselves. We're not always on time to fight crime. We're a little late. And so we have to work with the community to get the evidence so that we can go out there and do our job and take this guy to put him in custody. So, you know, if you're, if you're going to use that sort of language with someone, I'm, the concern I have is that it, it, it can build into a negative thing. It can oh, have certainly. Negative, and yeah. it, feed, it, it adds to the fire. It adds fuel to the fire that's already raging. Right. Um, you know, we, again, this is a meaty topic. And, man, maybe we need to either pick uh, leaner topics or go to two hours or something <laughs> because we always seem that we 
run out of time just as we start picking it's up a real speed. Cliffhanger. But uh, yeah, <laughs> but you know, we can pick this up at another show. It won't be the next show, but we'll um, okay. we'll maybe pick this up again, man. It was great having you on on the show, Charles. I really yeah, appreciate yeah, you coming yeah, in. Yeah, and I'll I'll work with Gil, even though I think he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good. So, so there we go. So folks, uh, we're gonna wrap this segment of the Ride Along Radio Show. Uh, I want to thank our executive producer, the poetess, for uh, queuing everything up and, and doing us right there. I want to thank intern Darren for his help today. Uh, thank my co-hosts, Kent mm. and Gil. And follow us on uh, Twitter, Ride Along Radio. Follow us on Instagram at Ride Along Radio Show. You can like us on Facebook at Ride Along Radio Show. Or you can send us an email at ridealongradioshow at gmail.com. And use that email address to send in ideas for future topics you'd like to see us cover. As you can see, we, we kind of uh, go from the shoulders on these topics, man. There's not a lot of not a lot of not holding, holding back. Not, not holding, holding back. back. So if you want to hear uh, something you want us to, to delve into, uh, shoot us an email on it, and uh, we're pretty responsive about that. And, and uh, we'll bring your bring your concerns out to the front there. So hey, we'll see you guys next Thursday right here on Morris Media Live, 11 a to 12 p Pacific Standard Time. Thanks.